Welcome to the Ministry of God's Word presented by Thamu Naidu. Thamu is the apostolic and founding elder of Gate Ministries Santon, located in Gauteng, South Africa. Blessed with worldwide travel and teaching, his mandate is to communicate the ancient biblical blueprint for the accurate building of the Church of God. Old message, new series. How's that? I want to start the series today with you, which I think is foundational to some of the provocative statements that have been made during the Apostolic Leadership Summit, and some stuff that we still have to get our minds to, even though, as I said, the day of provocation is the day of the Lord. The, Lord, the day of the Lord is the day of provocation. And God sometimes will confront the status quo of our thinking so that we can then get to know what His Word is really saying. And I really believe that 99.9% .9 of all our problems has got to do with mindset. And so I thought it would be important for me to present to you a series, and I don't know how long the series will take, uh, on, on giving you a definition of the spiritual man. The spiritual man. So I'm naming the series The Spiritual Man. When I use the word man, I'm using it in a gender-free context. I'm not in any way highlighting the masculinity of a man or the male, the male side of man. I'm basically using it in a gender-free, in a neutral way. So when I talk about man, I'm including the woman. Okay, the woman, the W-O-M-A-N. Um, I'm talking about the two, two people, the male and the female, that God refers to as let us make man in our image. And he made them, both male and female, in his image. So ladies, take it easy if you feel that you are being excluded from this, the spiritual man. Let me give you some introductory comments to what I want to say because I think it's very important for us to define terminology, vocabulary, lay foundations, understand the physiological and compositional makeup of this complex being that we call man or we call ourselves by. And so definition is very important. And I'd like for you, as you know, the culture of this house, you know, you're not going to come here in most cases and just get a three-point sermon. You're going to come here to get teachings that will build you up. Uh, that's the mandate God gave me. One of the easiest things to do in this house is to come and give you a motivational sermon. I was in East London and they told me, them, we are tired of motivational statements. We're tired of good, good humanistic, postmodern teachings behind pulpits. They said to me, and these are very educated people, some of them, they said to me, we can get that in seminars. We can get that by going to the places that some of us give such teachings. We want to come to the pulpit to get the Word of God. We want to get it in the way it should be given. And we want to get it so that it can be food to our beings, food to our lives, uh, so that we can, we can go out there and accurately represent God. And I've said this repeatedly, repeatedly from this pulpit. You are what you eat. You are what you eat. And if you eat the right food, you become what you eat. If you eat junk food, you become. If you eat the wrong diet, we're going to produce an anemic culture, a sick people. We have many doctors here and dietitians that will tell you that. So I want to talk about our constitution, our makeup. So let me firstly define the phrase, the spiritual man. The Greek word for spiritual is the word pneumatikos. It's a Greek word. It's a big word, nice word. Include it into your English vocabulary. Pneumatikos. P-N-E-U. M-A-T-I-K-O-S. Pneumatikos. It refers to that individual who has devoted his or her entire life to be governed by the will of God. When I speak about a spiritual man, I'm not talking about a spooky man. We have a lot of spooky people in the church today. Strange behavior. Get a prophetic word and they think they have to be, they have to sound differently. I have to say this. They have to 
change their voice. Even God gets confused. Uh, when I talk about a spiritual man, I'm talking about a perfectly normal man who loves watching soccer. I would not talk about rugby because some people in this region, not, not Johannesburg region, I'm talking about the other side, are not very happy right now. But I'm talking about a spiritual man, a spiritual man who is that individual who has devoted their entire, their complete life to be governed by the will of God. The spiritual or the pneumaticos man has made the decision to live under the domain and leadership of the Holy Spirit. Has made the decision to live under the domain, the dominion, and the leadership, the headship of the Holy Spirit. And in accordance with the Word of God. Because a lot of people will tell you today, the Holy Spirit said. But what the Holy Spirit said is in contradiction to what the Word said. And the Holy Spirit executes, expedites, administrates, distributes the wisdom of God that comes from the Word of God. So when we talk about a spiritual man, we're talking about a spiritual man who is not only under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, but lives in accordance with the Word of God, because the Holy Spirit will never violate the Word of God. He will only come to teach us about God's Word. And God's Word, when we live by God's Word, hear me carefully now, when we live by God's Word, we are living under the Constitution of the heavens. It's God's constitutional will that's communicated to us. God's word is not from the earth. It came from above. God's word came into the earth and incarnated and manifested itself in its fullness in the person of Jesus Christ. So when we talk about God's word, it is not ideology, philosophy, tradition, private interpretation, and so forth. We are literally talking about a word that is far above our ways. Even as the heavens are far above the earth, so is God's word above our ways. God has exalted his word even above heaven and earth. We need to unpack God's word, which is made up of precepts, statutes, principles, commandments, regulations, rules, uh, protocols, different expressions of a divine culture. It's a complex body of truth. And we need to start learning how to appreciate the constitution that comes from above. So a pneumaticos man has made the decision to live under the absolute domain of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, which is the constitution of a way that comes from above. In saying that, I want to throw in something that I think you need to appendage to this present viewpoint that I'm presenting to you. And that is, we cannot produce a Samaritan man. A Samaritan spirit is a half Jew and a half Gentile. He knows how and when to be Jew, and he knows when to be Gentile. In contemporary language, he's half spiritual and half secular. There is mixture in that person. That person plays musical chairs. They know how to behave in the church, and they're perfectly spiritual. And when they step out of the church, they live as if the context shapes their behavior. Such an individual God does not like. God hates the spirit of the Samaritan because it is a neutral, lukewarm, compromising spirit. You neither know, such a person does not know whether he is here or there. God will vomit such a spirit out. God hates it. God wants a people that is totally committed to him. And so when we talk about a spiritual man, we talk about a man that is that is in this world, but is not of this world, may be trained in the, in the, in the science, 
um, of the Chaldeans, may know the culture of the Babylonians, may even have got degrees in the courts and palaces and universities of Egypt, but such a man will not live under that system. They know how to serve the living God, the living God. And I can tell you today that we have produced the, Sam the Samaritan spirit in the church. That's why the, church, the world, when you study history, for example, during the days of Constantine, the, 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 the Christians enjoyed great favor because of the so-called conversion of Constantine in, in the fourth century. And large volumes of people from the Gentile world came into the church out of political correctness. They came into the church not because of a born again from above experience. They came because the emperor was a Christian. And if the emperor was a Christian, we'll all become Christians. And with it came a flood of secular and sorcerous practices. And the church became more demonic than ever before, even though favor was given to the governmental structure of the church. And you know today we have the papal city in Rome and so forth. Uh, and as a result, a great blessing became a curse. Today in the church, we use popular methodologies to raise the church. We use secular concepts, contextual thinking, situational thinking. The laws of relativity have governed the church. Because something looks right in our own eyes, we'll bring it in, in the name of growing the church and winning souls. We make them converts, and then twice as fit for hell. We need to come back to a place where we can be detoxed, debriefed, and sometimes uh, delivered from ways of thinking that, that contradict the way of God. So when I talk about the spiritual man, I'm talking about such a man who knows how to discern, dissect, know how not to live in a dichotomous position uh, of having one foot in the world and one foot with God. We need to know of a man who can live in Babylon but never allow Babylon to rule over his spirit. Uh, and you remember, God never takes us out of Babylon. He tells us we must rule in the midst of our enemies. Uh, and you can't be like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego or even Joseph or Moses in hostile environments and still allow for the glory of God to manifest for you. And that kind of a man we have to produce in the earth presently. So when I talk about a spiritual man, I'm talking about the behavior of an individual who is described as spiritual, not spooky, not acting strange, not changing your voice, being perfectly normal, not getting confused with this Pentecostal, sometimes the mystical side of Pentecostalism. And believe me, if you stay long enough in this church and you really want to be part of this church and you have those behavioral patterns, can I say it bluntly? You're going to get delivered. We want perfectly normal people in this church, but people that know how to touch heaven and earth, engage two realms because we become the interface between two dimensions. I'm not against um, um, us being spiritual in the sense of being overcome, falling down, getting slain, all that stuff, weeping, jumping, shouting, I'm not against all that. But I'm against that religious spirit that creeps in to make us look like we are not part of what God is building. Let me tell you, by the end of my series, which you, you will come to realize, this body was perfectly built to house all those expressions and to express them without acting fanatical and foolish. Amen? Because those are the things that have insulted God's plan and purpose in the earth. That's why some people don't want to be part of the church. The spiritual man is subjected to and directed by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I emphasize that. The spiritual man is subjected to and directed by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. The well-being of the earth is related 
to the dependency of the spiritual man on the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit. If you are led by the Spirit, the earth will get healed. Can I say that again? If you are led by the Holy Spirit, the earth will be healed of its corruption, of its problems. I also want to give you a definition of the natural man. So we got that. This is not the complete definition. I'm just, this is my introductory statements. But we'll go and study the spiritual man later. But let's talk about the natural man. Natural man. The Greek word for natural is the word psukikos. Nice name, eh? P S U C H I K O S. Psukikos. Psuki. Cause, which means flesh, in a sense. Oh, it's soulish, soulish, I beg your pardon, soulish. The suki cost man. Okay, we got the pneumatic cost man, spiritual man, pneuma, spirit, suki soul, psychology, psychos, sukos comes from that word. This, the suki cost or the natural man, refers to that individual who has chosen to live his or her life from the soul or the intellectual or rational part of his mind. Okay, so when we talk about a natural man, a, 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 a suki cost man, we're talking about that person who says, listen, I don't want to live from the heavens. I don't want to live by God's word. I don't want to live uh, being led by the Holy Spirit. I prefer to lean upon my own understanding. I choose to let my sensual abilities make, help me make decisions. I want to make decisions based on my view of life, my personal view, my intellectual view, my rational view, my experiential view, my subjective view. So this individual lives from the vantage point of the, the soul, or the mind of the soul. And I will show you there's a mind of the spirit and there's a mind of the soul. Two different minds in one body. The mind of the soul. So this person is influenced and resourced by environment. Environment shapes such a person. This person lives on empirical evidences. He wants facts. She wants information she wants or he wants to base his life on the environment and that's how we get a contextual theology a contextual theology where environment shapes behavior the cosmos the world system that is because such a person lives from this world the cosmos when i use the word cosmos i am not talking about planet earth please I want you to understand this because you need to know what I'm referring to and what I'm not referring to. The cosmos refers to that order or structure that regulates the function of the systems that sustains human life in the earth or that sustains life in the earth. Let me explain that. When I talk about cosmos, while the word cosmos in some interpretations can lend to the solar system, the universe we live in, which includes planet Earth. But there are many times when God speaks about the world, the cosmos, is not referring to the physical environment, is referring to the systems that rule over the planet. The planet. And, um, and these are governmental systems, cultural systems, uh, intellectual systems, philosophical systems, uh, and so forth, political systems, uh, economic systems, and, 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 and religious systems. That's the cosmos. So when I say that the natural man lives by the cosmos, I'm talking about the cultures in which they live. That's why you'll find a lot of people will struggle with some of the things I say, uh, because they still think culturally, they think linguistically, they think intellectually, they think um, racially, racially, they think uh, historically, they think sentimentally and traditionally. 
a lot of people think in terms of the environment in which they, they brought up. Some people cannot get delivered from their past. And so such a person lives within this present cosmos. So when I talk about the natural man living of the cosmos, I am not in any way suggesting that it is, is just living um, of the earth. I'm talking about how his mind, his spirit, his psyche is conditioned to think. And believe me when I tell you that we all have been brainwashed in some way or the other. We've all been negatively influenced in some way or the other. We all view things from a certain prejudice. And it is God's good intention to cleanse us. The word is catharsis. When God does a catharsis, he washes us. He purifies us. He uses the launderer's soap, the purifier's fire. And sometimes the refiner's pot. But the ultimate objective is that God wants to set us free from things. I was saying to the people in, in, in East London yesterday, I said to them, you know, if we're going to produce a new church in the earth, we cannot anymore view the church from racial and historical perspectives. I said I had to get delivered over a period of time from my own identity. And, and, and some people have a problem with what I say to them. I mean, I, was, I, thought, you know, I thought that I was an African of Indian descent. So, what, what, 17, 18? Just before we planted the river of life, that's 20 years ago. I went to India to speak at a conference there. And Marolan asked me the question as I was preparing to leave, are you nervous because you're going back to your motherland? fatherland, your homeland. I said, no, I've watched enough to know that they all look like me. <laughs> and I eat curry, they eat curry. So I'm going to go there and it's going to be great. And I remember getting out of the plane and the first thing that slapped me in my face was the heat. It was so hot that I could barely breathe. And then I, was, I had a culture shock driving from the airport and seeing how all these people were sleeping on the street, the pavement, for miles and miles and miles, kilometers. And then I got to my hotel and started to meet the people that I was going to be with, and I realized they were totally different from me. Totally different, totally. They spoke strange languages, and I couldn't understand it. I didn't like the food. I really didn't like the food. That's when I believed my wife's food was the best. <laughs> and then I came to the conclusion I was not an Indian. I was an African. I wanted to get back to Africa. That was home. I couldn't believe. I was actually saying things like, thank you, Lord, for the British that brought us coolies, <laughs> I mean indentured laborers, to work in the sugarcane fields, because life here is far better than out there. And it was tough then. And then as I started to graduate in my knowledge of God, and my knowledge of who I was created to be, I discovered I'm not African. That when I was born again, I'm a son of God. And that I'm not from Africa. I'm from above, and I'm not Indian, and I'm not African, I'm a son of God. I live in Africa, but I belong to a new nation. And the wall of demarcation was brought down, and I have now been connected to a new family. It was a peculiar people. They're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. A, a, a chosen generation, indescribable, aliens in a hostile environment, but a city in a city, a nation in a nation, a people amongst a people. I live here, but my constitution is from hell, from above. I belong to a common world, a common world. And my wealth does not come from my environment. And that there's only one thing I've asked God to do in this is help me stay focused 
on the knowledge of who I am. I'm a son of God, got royal blood. But I only asked him for one favor in that process. Don't deliver me from the love of curry. <laughs> That's all, spicy food. But the point I'm making is, all of us have to start thinking like this. You're not South Africans. You may have the vote, but you're not South Africans. You're sons of God first, living in South Africa to change the environment so that his kingdom can come and his will can be done on the earth. You're not Afrikaner, you're not English. I don't anymore judge a man by the color of his skin. I mean, it'll be politically incorrect for me to choose my staff, to choose the guest speakers I bring to conferences based on color of skin. That's political correctness. I can only choose people based on sound, of frequency, on purity, on who is bringing the word of the Lord, and if it comes packaged in a color I don't like, I can't do anything. I have to bring it because it's the sound I'm looking for and the purity and the innocence of that, not color. So if I put all whites on the stage, or all blacks, it's not about political correctness. We don't live in an affirmative culture. We live in a culture that discerns things not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And we know no man after the flesh since we accepted Christ. We know everyone by the Spirit. Amen? Not even Jesus, the Jew, by the flesh. That's what Paul says. And so, when I talk about cosmos here, I'm talking about a wicked system that has poison in it. It's called the ideology of this world. Something that, in a symbolic way, Daniel refused to drink the wine of Nebuchadnezzar. Simply because he knew that that wine was poisonous and he will not eat the food, the diet, the doctrine, the philosophies of Nebuchadnezzar because he knew that there was a heavenly way of drinking and eating. And you know the kingdom of God comes. Uh, that's, that's the inference when the Bible says the kingdom does not come through eating and drinking. Implied is that through the medium of eating and drinking, the kingdom comes, but if your focus is not on eating and drinking, it is on what it produces righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So I want to highlight the fact that when we talk about the Suki Kos man, we're talking about a man who he lives by his environment. That's why such a person has an erratic behavioral pattern. is psychologically on a kind of a roller coaster. Um, it's like, a, it's, it's like they just go around and around being walled and, and, and swayed by every emotion, by every feeling. Today they can be great, tomorrow they can have a mood swing. Because they don't live from the eternal, from the invisible. They live by environment. Environment. Such a man, politics and the price of, of petrol going up and, and, and uh, work situations and... Uh, and insecurities in the marketplace, uh, all of those things influence behavior. Such individuals are not learning to understand. And no matter how expensive things become, God will take care of us. And I'm not encouraging an irresponsible position. I'm not. I'm a pragmatist. But at the same time, I want to tell you to know that it's not going to get better in this world. Economically speaking, it's not going to get worse, better. Politically speaking, it's not going to get better. It's not going to get better if you choose to live in the cosmos. It's not. I'll tell you why. Because we have a maturation of the tares and the wheat in the season. We have a maturation of darkness and a maturation of light. We have two aeons climaxing. We have consummate moments reaching their fullness. And evil, gross darkness will cover the earth but also gross light will cover those who are living in the earth. Arise, shine, for the light has come upon you, as we sang to them. And so, it's not going to get better. And if you choose to live, you have to choose, you can't choose to be politically correct and say, I'll do what Babylon says, and when it suits me, I'll do what God says. You have to choose you today whom you will serve. You have to choose, and you have to choose whether you want to live by your soul, Oh, you want to live by the Spirit. So these individuals, 
these suki caste people are influenced by the spirit of this world. I want to put First uh, Corinthians on the board. First Corinthians chapter two. I want to read this. Can, can we do some reading? I love the reading of the scriptures because it's, it's part of the apostolic culture. That's why we do it every Sunday. That's why we, 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 read the, we publicly read the scriptures. We're not ashamed of the word of God. Amen? I'm of the opinion that praise and worship does not bring you, does, does not pierce darkness, does not neutralize the enemy. That's a misconception. The Bible says the word is a two-edged sword. You speak the word, it will pierce the darkness and create the environment for us to worship God. And, um, and so this word needs to be read more often. More often. And that's why we break bread also, because it's part of the apostolic culture. And I, and I brethren, now I don't read from Amplified. And I don't read from Message. I read from the most boring text, New King James, close to the Old Test. I'm teasing them, okay? So you can laugh at that one. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom according to you, the testimony of God, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything amongst you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, please believe me when I tell you, it does not mean he didn't use good speech. I've heard people say, oh, it is by the foolishness of preaching, men shall be saved. The Bible does not say by foolish preaching. It says by the foolishness of a medium called preaching, men shall be saved. So we get people come here and they put on a crazy show and they say, it's not about my cleverness, it's by my foolishness. No, that's not what God's saying. What God is saying is he will he'll use the medium called preaching, which is such a foolish medium, and people will get born again. Isn't that amazing? I mean, have you ever tried reading Paul's books? Do you know how difficult Paul is to understand? He's so difficult that the fisherman Peter said, I can't understand him. And Peter had a revelation directly from God, but he couldn't understand Paul. But Paul was saying, I didn't lean upon my intellect. I didn't lean upon the PhDs I had. And he had a few. I, I'm not drawing attention to the fact that one of the greatest teachers of my time, Gamaliel, a, a, a professor, you know, of note, taught me. Now, I'm not leaning on all that. When I come to you, I'm trying to tell you, not through my clever presentation of a treatise, I'm trying to tell you that there is a wisdom that comes from God. And, I'm, and I've tried to present that to you more than my intellectual positions. Okay, and then he says this, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, and I love that word weakness, it means physical frailties. This was a sick guy, I, I mean sick in his body. Sick in his body, he was weak, he was frail, he had an illness, I, I think he had a bad eyesight. I don't think he was fully healed after the Damascus Road experience. I believe that God gave him partial sight but not complete sight. Because later on in the book of Galatians, Paul would say, I knew that some of you treated me as if I was an angel of God. In fact, you received me as if I was God. And he went on further to say, he said, in that portion of scripture, he said, and some of you would even have plucked your eyes out to give it to me so I could have an eye transplant. That's what he said. And I believe that God allowed him to always have a kind of an eye that was not fully opened. So he will never allow the natural eye to view things, but the spiritual eye. And if you understand a patriarchal culture, you can study this with people like Jacob. Some of the greatest prophecies that Jacob released took place when he was totally blind in the natural. When he was blind on his deathbed, he could not see. That's when he blessed, um, he blessed the sons of Joseph and transferred patriarchal blessings. He prophesied over the other 11 tribes uh, in Genesis chapter 49. And he did that when his natural eye was closed, his spiritual eye was open. And Paul understood this. You can only see in the spirit when your natural eye is closed. He understood that. That's why God put scales in his eye. And then when he eventually opened it, it was so that he will never anymore look after the natural, but in the spiritual. 
Isn't that amazing? You know, some of us, our biggest, our greatest strengths can be our biggest weaknesses. And what's our greatest strength? Most of us have a university degree. Most of us have been trained in some way or the other. And uh, we've been taught uh, how to analyze. Uh, if you've done postgraduate studies, uh, you know, analytical thinking, which comes from a Greek world, is a very important part of our lives. We analyze everything, we weigh things, we measure things, we extract things, we, we check things out. We are taught to be suspicious. And, and those of you that lecture here will know what I'm saying. And Paul is saying, I had to learn how to die to all of those things. Learn how to die. Now look at this further. And my speech, I was with you in weakness, in fear, in fear, phobos, which literally means it was a phobia. I came with reverence, respect, with a, a degree of nervousness, a sense of knowing that I don't know it all. It's a good position to have. And in much trembling, much trembling. I mean, this is a wonderful picture of a great man of God. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit of power. Now, I was a Pentecostal for many years, and I'm still one. And I thought, wow, that meant power. You know, God's man of power for the hour. Uh, power. I thought, wow, it was shouting and screaming and, and all of those things. But get the picture here. It's, there's a phobia in a good way. There's a respect, there's a trembling, there's a nervousness. I don't want to use my intellect. I don't want it to supplant what God wants to do. I am coming to these people knowing that whatever must happen, must happen by the administration of the Spirit. And, and he's, he's giving us a paradigm that sometimes we blow out of proportion in Pentecostal circles. And so he says, but I've come to you in the demonstration, the, the manifestation or the showing forth of the spirit and of the power and that, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men but in the power of God and, and we'll talk about the exousia uh, because that's not power as in boom bang crash come here catch my coat fall down because you couldn't catch it uh, you know that that is demonstrative it's the it's the spectacular that's not what God's looking for he's talking about power as in administrating the grace of God, the anointings, um, the dispensation of time that God has given to him, the, the, the unveiling of hidden truths, uh, the deep secrets locked up in God's mind. Uh, all of this stuff he wants to bring to the forefront. However, we speak wisdom amongst those who are mature. Now hear this, and he says this, and the mature year will be the spiritual man. And later on, he'll show you how the natural man works. And a natural man, I need to say this if I forget to say it later, is not an unsaved man. You can be natural and still saved, but you would not be able to go into the mature things of God because you choose to live under the rule of the soul which was created by God. Not by the devil. The soul was not created by the devil. It was created by God. God actually was the architect of the soul. But the way it was supposed to be administrated sometimes gets hijacked. Uh, uh, and, and we lay siege to the soul so that it can't come under its proper functionality. And so he says here, uh, wisdom, uh, wisdom amongst those who are mature. Write this word down, please. The word for mature is the word teleos. Teleos, T-E-L-E-I-O-S. And it speaks about a person that's complete. Uh, complete in the, his mentality, his moral character in the manner in which he manages his labor, his spiritual growth. We're talking about a person of full age, uh, uh, not perfect as in sinless, but a person who was brought to a well-rounded position, a finished position in God. Um, this is what, a person of integrity and value and virtue, a full-grown person in these areas. And these are things lacking in the church, things like values, virtue, integrity, character, morality, these things are lacking. That's why you can have today people in the church, they can come to church, they can do well. They leave church, they go back to the universities or to the workplace, and they live no different to the world. 
no different. They can lift their hands and worship the Lord. They, they're completely swayed by the environment they are in. And such, and such people love God, but they're not yet mature enough to walk in the fullness of God. Okay, and so we need to deal with these things. And then he says, but we speak the wisdom of God in mystery. Okay, let me finish this. Not, not, yet not the wisdom of this age, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. In other words, God's going to neutralize them. He's going to disarm them. He's going to shut them down. We, so we're not going to follow that wisdom, even though we have to learn that wisdom. And I encourage all our kids here to go and study, go study, go study, get degrees, get degrees. But you must know from what administration you're functioning. Okay, learn about the world, learn how they think, but don't become like them. Then he says this, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory. I mean, it goes back in time. You want to talk about time travel? Yes, time travel. Stepping out of time into timelessness, into the eternal, the timeless, the, the, the ancient pathways. That's where we want to get to. And believe me, God can put it on your heads. You know, we are living in a season where God's going to give us the head of an old lion, but we can have the body of a young lion. Amen? We can have wisdom of the ages on our heads, but we can have the the vitality and the, the, uh, and, the, uh, and the physicality of a young lion. And that, that's going to come. Believe me, one of the things you're going to see happening in the season, even old people are going to feel young, but with an old head. Because old people that feel young can get dangerous. <laughs> okay? Uh, and... Um, we are going to start to see things happening like we've not seen before. Which none of the rulers of the sage knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Isn't that amazing? Then it goes further to say, because we often quote that scripture without reading the next verse. But, everyone say but. God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. So what is God saying? I'm exposing myself to everyone. My spirit, which I put in you, knows me. And because my spirit knows me, he knows everything about me, even the deep things in me. If you went to Genesis chapter 1, you will understand how God, out of the deep, brought forth the light. Uh, and uh, that speaks about the depths, the infathomable depths of God, and how God wants to bring things out. And I believe we're living in the season where you're going to discover God in ways that you've not experienced him before. The stuff that's going to come out of the Bible. I mean, we are almost 2,000 years old now as a church in the earth. We're going to discover things that I think. If Paul sits in that cloud, he'll be scratching his head and saying, wow, you mean I wrote that and I didn't understand it the way these guys are expounding it? And that's how it should be. So through a glass darkly, we're going to see clearly. And how are we going to see? Because we're going to produce a spiritual man in the earth. That man knows how to connect to the eternal, the deep, the, uh, the uncomplicated dimensions of God and, 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 and experience the things that comes out of him. For, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Let's be honest today. In each one of you, there's a spirit. Am I correct? Your spirit. Okay, you're a spirit. You're a soul. You're a body. Right now, you know whether you're listening to me or not. Am I correct? You know whether you, your spirit knows whether you're here or whether you're all there. <laughs> your spirit knows some stuff in you, like the spirit knows stuff in me. Now imagine God's spirit, who knows everything about God. He took that spirit and put it in you. If that spirit can rule your spirit, Everything your spirit will house will be 
a knowledge of what was in and is in God. And that's what we want to bring into the earth today. Um, we want to bring this kind of a dimension of our faith together. And then it says this, even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world. Can you see this? Not the Spirit of the world. But what have we received? But the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So suddenly it's not about I have not seen, uh, no the ear heard, uh, nor have entered into the heart of the man of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But we know now that all of that stuff can be made known to us. And how can it be known to us? If we make a decision, I'm not going to be a Sukikos man, I'm going to be a pneumaticos man. I'm not going to be a natural man living by the natural world, but I'm going to be a spiritual man living by the Spirit. And the Spirit will bring that stuff into my life. And then he says this, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual but the natural man, the, the, the sukikos man, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Does not. He'll come here, he'll listen to the word, he'll go out of here, and the situations of the world will steal it. A bird will come and eat the seed. He'll we'll go from here and say, but it's his opinion. Oh, that's a good thought, but he doesn't understand the real world we live in. He doesn't understand what I go through. And so that natural man has got a thousand and one reasons why he or she will not accept what God is saying. But the spiritual man compares things with the spirit and he says, I'll take it. My brain doesn't make sense of it, but I'll take it. And I'll live it out. Now you may must make a choice because when I start going into these teachings, which will take weeks, you need to make a decision on in which realm you want to live. Which were all. And then we will start to talk about the conflict between soul and spirit. Uh, Segi will call it the two natures. I don't like the word nature, so we'll find better words to describe these things. But I think I understand what he's saying when he talks about the Adamic nature and how this thing can creep up when you don't know from which domain you're living. Which domain. But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Why? Because the natural man can't judge, judge the spiritual man. When you operate in this realm, you can't be judged in the flesh. And if you are judged, they can't find fault with you, like Jesus. Why? Because you're a spiritual man, you're a heavenly man, you operate from a different dimension, and people don't even know how to appraise you. Or they don't even know how to define you. You're a completely different person in terms of the dimensions of God. Have you got that? So, these natural suki cost people function from a rationalistic perspective that is earthly in nature and wisdom. So reason, rationalistic thinking, calculations, analysis, evaluations, defines them. The natural man may have goodness. Listen to me carefully now. The natural man, the Sukikos man can be a good man, a wonderful man, a kind man, a charitable man. He can have all these wonderful attributes locked up in him. The natural man may have goodness resident in, its, in his nature, her nature but is disconnected from the throne. One of the biggest mistakes in the church today is that we use our goodness to justify our spirituality. And sometimes we can do what, you know, we, can, we have a list of things that tell us why I'm good. You know, I'm not like that. I tied, I come to church, I keep the fast, I keep the feast, I do all this stuff. I'm not a sinner like that man. 
But that man operates from his soul, even though he's morally and ethically good, but he's not spiritually connected. He's disconnected from the throne. So when I talk about a spiritual man, I'm talking about a man that is so connected to the throne, so connected to the throne, that he will not do anything outside of the throne. The, suk, the, 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 the suki cost, the natural man, is infantile in his or her spiritual growth. They are babies. They do not understand the deep things. Of, they're born again, but they're babies. Because when Paul writes this in Corinthians, he's not talking about the unsaved. He's talking about a person that's underdeveloped. They love to be fed with milk. And now, you know, and that's something. You know, when God asked us to come and plant this church two years ago, and um, uh, it was not easy to come here and, and start to dish out all this teaching. And believe me, it's not to impress anyone. It's because God's using this as a platform through which he's going to do things. You know, and things are happening. Things are happening at an alarming rate. Every week, ministries are coming and submitting themselves to this house. Uh, you know, in the week of the school, we had one, church, one, one man in Africa that came and submitted himself and a thousand churches to our oversight. Passionately hungry for the season. The head of a denomination, leading denomination that is nationally recognized. And you know, the temptation is to come here and to create a nursery. Create a nursery. And to breastfeed or bottle feed people. The temptation is to come here and give you nice stories, great illustrations, and tell you how to be morally good. And, and, and we'll grow this church very fast. But that's not what God mandated this house to do. God mandated this house to pull down stuff from the heavens and to feed you with it. There is food that comes from heaven. There's a bread that comes from heaven. And you know how difficult that is to bring little children into this church? I've not yet encouraged the children's ministry in this church, not because I don't want to. We will start a children's ministry. We'll start a youth ministry soon. We'll be starting many things, many things. Do you know how hard it is to make little kids sit here in church? Sit here and not keep them occupied? Why? Because those children have the same spirit configuration as you adults. It may not be nurtured and developed, but it's there. It's there. A little child can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Am I correct? Jesus was baptized in the womb. Even though there was an affirmative demonstration of the baptism at the River Jordan. But the Holy Spirit was in him in the womb. Same with John the Baptist. Acts chapter 2 tells us, you and your children can receive the Holy Ghost. And the easy part is, keep them busy. Yes, we will have training for our kids. Yes, we'll have de special programs developed for them. Yes, we will address the needs, the homogenous needs of the various sectors of our community. Yes, we'll address all of those things. But do you know, if you went to a mosque, Little children will be sitting with their parents. Boys will be kneeling with their fathers. Mothers will be on their prayer mats with their children, their daughters. Am I correct? We've got some Muslims here. Am I correct? Not Muslims. We've got <laughs> we're some sons of God <laughs> that once were... <laughs> But think with me. How many little kids are sitting here? Can you hear noise? They may not fully understand everything, but the Spirit is working in them. The anointing will manifest in them. Why? Because we're dealing with this. We're not talking to the intellect. We're talking to the Spirit. And that Spirit, a little boy called jo Joash, was eight years old and he was ordained to be king. A little boy 
was 12 years old. His name is Jesus. He could talk to the doctors of theology in the temple. You understand? You study the scriptures. If our kids are conditioned right, they can pick up the things of God. And you know what the Bible says in the last days? Even babes and sucklings will speak the things of God. I'm believing that our young people are going to have such an anointing upon their lives. They'll speak deep things that will even, even confound people that have been in seminaries l- learning to get their degrees, and their doctorates. God can do this. How many of you parents believe with me? How many of you little children believe with me? Amen. I can see some hands going up. Small hands, but they're going up. And I believe that these things are going to happen. They're going to happen. And so, when we talk about spiritual growth, it's got nothing to do with your age. You can be 99.9 years old and be like a little child, not developed. And you can be 10 years old and be more mature than the 99.9 year old. It's all got to do with how you're going to get your spirits developed in the season. I want to produce a spiritual man in this house. And I believe we're going to produce it. It's people that are not just fed with milk. But also people who can learn how to move from a place called drinking milk to eating meat. How many of you want a nice steak? This is when Afrikaners should say amen. (laughs) And the Indians, a chop. But we need to understand from the same cow comes the meat and the milk. The milk and the meat. And I believe that while we would provide systems of development that will produce milk, but the spiritual man is not wanting milk. He wants meat. Meat. Believe me, and I'm saying this now, please hear me, uh, hear me carefully. I deal with pastors every week I'm speaking to a body of pastors. And I say this respectfully. Because we have created a culture in church circles where we're not feeding people meat, the things I say even to people that are preaching from the pulpit are too difficult to understand. But some of them are noble enough to say we've been wrongly conditioned in our thinking. We're going to get back to the place where we can learn again. That's why we have apostolic schools in Peter Meredith's book, to introduce pastors to the higher things in God. And as God has taught us, we share those things with people out there. And believe me, it's this transformation taking place simply because now even leaders of churches are saying, we can't be feeding our people milk and we can't be drinking milk. So as we receive meat with the wisdom of God, we will share it to our people. Okay, let's go to one more, to one more scripture. 1 John 2.16. Are you all with me? You with me? One John 2.16. Oh, I tend to John. Let me just get one John. First epistle of John, chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse, from verse 12 to get the context. I write to you, little children. Look at the words. I write to you, little children, because your sins, excuse me, are forgiven. You, for his name's sake, I write to you, fathers. So there's two categories in the church, children and fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, This is a developmental culture because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you little children, excuse me, because you have known the father. I have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. 
do not love the world, the system of the world, or the things of the world, in the world. If anyone loves the world, excuse me, the, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, this is what's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world system, that is, is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So when we talk about a natural man, we are actually talking not only about a natural man, but a, a man who operates in a completely different dimension. This man lives by the lust of the flesh. He lives by the lust of the eyes. He lives by the pride of life. In fact, this man marries his flesh and his soul together, and he allows for the environment in which he lives to become the source that sustains his or her worldview. And such a person measures his life by the things he sees. He sees and desires. Such a person. This person measures success by houses, cars, symbols of success, status, rising up the rungs of the ladder, um, you know, find security in finances, and so forth. Now, I'm not against all of that. I mean, we, we, you will find in this house, you will get prosperity. Without teaching prosperity, and some of you are already telling me stories, what God's doing. We will get the best of everything, the best. You will, you will dress with the best clothes, you will eat the best food, you will have the best holidays, you will rise up the rungs of the ladder, unexpectedly, promotion will come to you. I tell you this, but we don't chase those things. It's not part of our worldview. Ambition does not fuel our desires. We, this world system does not in any way appeal to us. We know how to, to live in this world, but it does not condition our thinking. The spiritual man does not look, live like that. The natural man does. Because that man lives from the sensuality of his soul. The soul has five gates. The soul measures everything by sight. You remember Reuben? He looked at things with his eye. Reuben means to see with your intellect, with your eye. And he saw what his father had and wanted it. And he took it. It's called taking your father's concubine. And when he took it, he lost the coat of many colors, the firstborn status in his father. Why? He saw things. He operated from that dimension. There are another group of people that not only go by, the, the, by sight, they go by hearing in the natural. They, the, the, the hearing of the soul. Remember Simeon? Simeon? Simeon is the person who was the second son of Leah a father of a tribe, he went by what he heard, rumor. He went by just intellectual hearing, information gathering. And, and you know, he was accused as being a brutal man by God, who will kill a man without thinking. Why? Because he just went by what he heard. And you know how many people, how, how many characters are assassinated because of rumor? People listening to things that's not verified, not discerning, and hearing with the spirit. That man once saw by, by you know, one lived by his eyes, the other lived by, by hearing. And we can go on, on the list of sons. And, and there's the touch, there's the smell, there's a the taste. Some people just live for that. Sight, smell, taste, hearing, touching. We cannot live like that. The natural man lives like that. Environment, comfort. I mean, I learned one thing. If I live in a shack, I'll be content. If I live in a palace, I'll be content. The palace or the shack is just an environment. It, doesn't, it does not define me. I define my environment. I'm the son of God. I'm a spiritual man living in a body. And the body is part of the spiritual man. I don't have to leave the body to be spiritual. The body was built to enjoy the spiritual dimension. I'll talk about those administrations the week ahead. But 
you as a people here have to make a decision today lust of the eyes lust of the flesh pride of life and we'll unpack those some of those statements you need to ask yourself am i a suki cost man am i living like that do you know how many people live for a new car a new a new job a new house for salary for those things those things so corrupt the things that god wants to do in our lives okay are you ready to to break these spirits in our lives let me just define the fleshly man all this is introduction you know that the fleshly man sarkikos the sarkikos man okay pneumatikos sukikos now sarkikos don't name your child after these names <laughs> pneumatikos okay sarkikos s a r k i k o s s a r k i k o s this is an individual who lives only for his physical body this is an individual you know this is a pretentious i use these words often pretentious ostentatious it's a it's a kind of charlatan spirit you try to put on an outward appear appearance but it's deception of the highest order where where image is important image 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 you live for your body you you live to eat i know of people that live to eat and eat to live you just love to dress you just love and it's so shallow but it's them this person becomes no different to the beast with two orders of individuals created on the sixth day one were called beast these were the animals in the various kingdoms but they referred to as beast they just live for grass they live to pre- to be a predator they live to conquer they just live to survive and then you got the other category in the sixth day called man he does not live to eat dust he lives to eat the food of the heavens that's how that person functions now we have a sulky cost man just flesh that's why there's no control no control that's why there are people that can just fall into the trap of lustful relationships where pornography and sexual activity you know there's no conscience anymore you just love to gratify the flesh the flesh you measure things by food eaten wine drunk and image clothing jewelry and it's a pretentious culture god hates that while the bible says we should be adorned but our adorning takes place in the spiritual realm and let me tell you something about true beauty such a person you know their beauty is superficial they can look immaculate on the outward i often use rachel as an example respectfully because rachel had outward beauty but spiritually she had no iq iq and believe me when i say that she couldn't even name a son which is dying she calls him benoni <laughs> which means son of my sufferings through you i'm dying that's what it literally means who's living in benoni here <laughs> she takes idols with him and does not give it back to her father but sits on it and acts like she's you know going through that period <laughs> where she can't move and um and never gave up her idols dies on the road to fruitfulness called if Eph, ifrata which later was renamed bethlehem the house of bread but never gets to the place of her destiny gets buried on the alongside the road and a heap of stones not in the grave of macpella the the place where the patriarchs and their spouses are buried the woman that was loved by jacob but superficial her beauty was skin deep that's the sulky cost person never i mean leah the one hated was buried with jacob in machpela the grave of double honor the grave of covenant in hebron and when i think about all of this i realize how superficial people are do you know that this color of skin whether it's white or black is not what god looks at 
It's just the tent. He uses it to manifest his glory. It becomes a physical place through which he reveals himself. But God's not interested in this flesh. God's looking at inward beauty. He's looking at who you are on the inside. And that's why when people judge people by the color of their skin, by the texture of their hair, by their height, and so forth. <laughs> height. <laughs> why did I have to say that? <laughs> by the way, I'm a tall man. It's your perception. <laughs> I'm taller than all of you right now. But when we judge things by the natural, by the flesh, we will never understand the spirit. And so when we talk about a sulky cosman, we're talking about that individual who lives for his or her physical body. Their whole lives revolve around their physical bodies. Physical bodies. You see it in Hollywood, you see it in most of the modern centers of life. They look beautiful, but they're empty. It's vanity. Vanity. These individuals live to gratify the deeds of their material body. We've read 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. You can read 2 Peter 2, 1 to 22. Uh, put it on the board. 2 Peter chapter 2. Philippians chapter 3, verse 19 to 20. You can note that. But one, 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to start closing with this. But there were also false prophets amongst the people, even as there will be false teachers amongst you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who, brought, who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. These are false preachers. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. But if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned to dis them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelt amongst them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of the temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh. Mark these words. God will judge those who, who, who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous self world they, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, where the angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. But these, like natural, this is the fleshly man, brute beast, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand. The man who lives after the flesh does not understand things of the Spirit. They can speak without thinking and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have hearts, they have a heart trained in covetous practices. 
and I cursed children. They have forsaken the right way and have gone astray. Following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they are learned through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after the law, uh, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they become entangled in them, entangled in them, and overcome the latter end. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit. And a sow, having washed to a wallowing in the mire. I will stop there. Those are harsh words. And while it's addressing preachers, it's also addressing people that are saved. When I talk about the pneumaticos, the sukikos, or the sarkikos, I'm talking about people in the church. I'm not talking about people out there. I'm talking about people in the church. These epistles were addressed to people in the church. They get saved, they come in, but they choose to live by the flesh. And God says, they are no different to a dog that goes back to the vomit or a pig, excuse me, a pig that goes back to a maya. God forbid, while we have a thousand and one faults, God forbid that we become beastly in our behavior and live no different to animals. We are the sons of God. Tell your neighbor, you're a son of God. We must live like the sons of God. Amen? You have faults? Confess them. Ask God to help you. He'll deliver you. But don't stay in your vices and expect God to help us. Amen? Now, this is the introduction. It may get worse or better in the weeks ahead. <laughs> but let's come with a heart that will learn about who we are so that we can be the people God wants us to be. Amen. Will you stand with me? Thank you for your time.